Hola, soy Yolanda Quintana, soy secretaria general y cofundadora de la PDL. Yolanda Quintana, I'm co-founder and general secretary of the platform for the defense of the freedom of speech and information. Together with me, we will have Lorenzo Cotino. Hello, I'm Lorenzo Cotino. I'm professor of constitutional law at the University of Valencia, a member of the platform of defense and of the freedom of information. Welcome everybody to this uh, day on the Digital uh, Services Act and the Digital Marketing Act uh, organized together with the University of Valencia and the PD, uh, PLD and Prodigioso Volcan. As you know, these uh, uh, norms uh, will be a key point for the future of internet. So with lawyers and experts and together with people from the organization for the freedom of uh, uh, press, we are going to study the impact of these norms for rights such as the freedom of expression, freedom of speech, or the right of protest and defense. So we will study whether these laws will be, will be implemented uh, preventively or if governments will have the excuse to act uh, with uh, no control and uh, we'll check uh, which contents will be deliberately uh, published on the internet and which uh, way will be enabled to regulate uh, what is published on the internet. Once uh, this um, regulation is published, uh, uh, this uh, law of uh, digital services, uh, the regional governments will have to amend their regional uh, law. So there will be a direct impact, impact uh, on the citizens. So to analyze all of this and to give an answer to all the questions that uh, are worrying all of us and uh, obviously all the people who have uh, connected to this event, we've organized uh, this webinar, which will be the framework for a report uh, that uh, will be analyzed from the P uh, DLI. It will be a report uh, that has been drafted by John Baratha, which uh, will be talking today. As we will have time to discuss this important act for the next generation for platforms for social media, uh, we will we need a, a legal framework which is clear on what the states can do and what they can't, whether they can block or impose filters to the platforms to the, the facts that they can do or that they should do and whether they can establish it, this kind of, of filters and which are the limits uh, for them, uh, which is the, the domain in which they can uh, apply these uh, policies, uh, the, the reach of these policies, the possibility of establishing protocol to detect uh, wrong uh, news or harmful content. And we all, will also deal with the warranties uh, that the users have for uh, re retrieving their information from the internet uh, and the warranties provided by, by the European Union. Thank you. From the PDLI, we have promoted this uh, webinar, but we also demanded uh, the drafting of a report by an expert. Uh, he's uh, John Barata. He's a researcher uh, from the Stanford University. He over international organizations, uh, and he's uh, an expert in this uh, matter. He has devoted last month to analyze this act uh, and to propose improvements, uh, and he has uh, uh, focused on a concept that uh, is, spe uh, is specifically worrying the systemic risk and the obligations that the platforms we have to mitigate them. So for me, it's a pleasure to give the floor to John Barata, who will present a summary of this report, which will be available on our website as well. Thank you, Yolanda. Thanks, Lorenzo. And thanks to 
all the people who made this event possible, the different organizations that have involved in the logistics, uh, such as uh, Prodigios of Volcan, University of Valencia, and of course, uh, DPDLI, who has uh, had this uh, initiative in the framework of freedom of uh, speech be covered in, in, the, in the next panels so uh, in order for our foreign experts to 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 also i mean uh, you, um, listen to me in, in 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 english and not not in spanish i mean i, I also take this opportunity uh, to remind you that you have a, a little sign here that it's the, the sign of the the earth that it says interpretation in case you, you don't understand spanish or english uh, then you click there and you can select the, the language the, of interpretation so uh, let me start by saying something that is obvious that which is the fact that the the dsa the digital services act uh, proposal of a regulation at the level of the eu was uh, very much expected uh, at the end of uh, 2020 it was finally uh, released and what we found was a project uh, text that is uh, very complex very sophisticated very comprehensive perhaps the most sophisticated and the most complete proposal that has been put forward um, in the world in different regions of the world or different countries of the world if we see now the different initiatives that are being discussed um, i would also say that the, the dsa as a proposal um, and the debates around the dsa are having an impact and influence beyond the, the EU borders. Uh, nowadays, we, we very soon, I think, that we'll be seeing a very important discussion uh, in the United States about the reform of uh, Section 230, which would be the, the equivalent to the e-commerce directive and the Digital Services Act uh, in Europe. We see uh, relevant and sometimes worrying initiatives in other parts of the world, like for example, uh, India, uh, where uh, uh, in Latin America, for example, where some of the ideas of the DSA or some of the issues that now uh, we, we have, will be putting on the table with regards to the DSA are also uh, under discussion. Just to put an example, um, something that has been included in the DSA is a series of provisions uh, pu pushing states uh, to, uh, let's say, force platforms to have offices, to have representatives in the member states of the European Union. And this is something that within the European context has been seen as normal, perhaps. Whereas, I mean, the same provisions were implemented uh, in countries like Turkey or India have stirred a very important debate on whether this can represent risks for the persons, for the staff of these companies that are present in these countries because the kind of uh, rule of law principles and the safeguards that exist there are not the same as the ones that we have in Europe. So here we have uh, a debate about human rights implications of, of the DSA, of certain aspects aspects of the DSA that if taken outside the, the or beyond the limits of the European Union can also trigger different kinds of debates. So I think it's very important to be aware of the fact that the, the DSA has triggered a very important discussion with the European Union, but this discussion was also goes beyond the context of the European Union. The third, uh, I mean, initial idea, initial remark that I wanted to make is that the DSA has been formulated in the context of, of the existence of a, already a very complex articulated legal system at the EU level, a legal system where we have the e-commerce directive that was adopted in the year 2000 and the DSA will in fact complement uh, the provisions of the e-commerce directive but more recently we have witnessed the, the adoption of the copyright directive, the so-called copyright directive that incorporates provisions that are very problematic or have generated lots of debates and controversies. The audiovisual media services directive that includes relevant provisions applicable to uh, platforms uh, for that, uh, that allow users to, to share videos online and also the regulation on terrorist content online that contains very important obligations, particularly obligations for platforms when it comes to dealing with terrorist content uh, online. And 
we it is expected and assumed that the DSA will complement this already complex legal uh, framework and will help in finding uh, the interpretative clues to all these different uh, notions that are already present in the EU legal system and also uh, create the basis for a more homogeneous interpretation of certain notions and at least look for the clarification of certain notions that since the year 2000 have been uh, uh, discussed and have been the object, for example, of decisions uh, before uh, by, by the court uh, in Luxembourg. The main elements of the DSA, we, I mean, this is something that has been already outlined by, by many experts and by many articles, pieces. I mean, the, the DSA uh, maintains the liability exemption principle. This is something that I will not discuss here, but I think that the most relevant part of the DSA uh, are the provisions that include new obligations for platforms and obligations that are particularly aimed at preserving, protecting, guaranteeing the rights of users. And here we can find obligations in the field of transparency, in the field of uh, access to remedies, in the field of due process, uh, accountability, and as we will see, a few uh, or a series of obligations with of, uh, what we can call duty of care. Uh, on the side of platforms uh, or in the form of risk mitigation obligations, as I will uh, explain a little bit later. The human rights approach is to a certain extent weak uh, in the sense that there are references to the need to preserve the right to freedom of expression, particularly when platforms implement certain obligations, but the uh, text is not clear regarding how, exactly how, these uh, human rights and particularly freedom of expression need to be incorporated into the practice of platforms according to which parameters, according to which criteria, and which are the specific safeguards that will guarantee that no excessive interventions, no excessive restrictions to the right to freedom of expression will result from the new provisions. Uh, there are three areas, at least in my, the, the report that I prepared that will be released. If, not, if it's not released already, it will be released in the course uh, of the day for you to read in more detail. There are three areas that I think that are particularly relevant as part of this debate about the impact of the DSA on the right to freedom of expression. The first one has to do with possible extraterritorial effects uh, that certain orders issued by national authorities on the basis of the DSA may have. In particular, Article 8 puts in the hands of national authorities, not only judicial authorities, but administrative authorities in case in the case uh, the, the, the national legislation empowers them to do so, to issue orders uh, to act against illegal content, to issue orders to platforms. These orders uh, will be based on the, on the way national authorities interpret EU law and national law, but these orders, according to this article, may have, can have huge extraterritorial effects, let's say effects that would go, could go beyond the borders of the European Union. So this is something that probably when, when drafted by the European Commission, perhaps the implications of uh, such orders and the impact that these orders would have in the legal system, in the non-EU legal systems, perhaps it's something that was not properly considered, but no doubt that these orders may have an impact on the way platforms moderate, pla uh, platforms moderate content and may also trigger over removal of content in non-EU areas. So I think that this is something that, I mean, the, when it comes to the drafting of Article 8, something that needs to be 
um, carefully analyzed and perhaps find further safeguards in order to avoid the imposition by one member state, the imposition of the authorities of one member state of a specific interpretation on the scope of the right to freedom of expression. The second area refers to the notice and action mechanisms, Article 14, that is to say the possibility for um, uh, third parties to request to inform platforms that a certain piece of content could be illegal. Here, um, the, the, the article is drafted in a way that might trigger uh, as well the over removal of content because it's not clear I mean, to what extent just the simple fact uh, that a third party uh, um, alleges the fact that a piece of content is illegal, this per se uh, gives rise to actual knowledge uh, in terms of responsibility for the platform. Uh, the way this is drafted seems to suggest that the mere fact of sending the notice and the mere fact that the notice contains a certain allegation, this might be sufficient in order to give rise to knowledge uh, uh, from the side of the platform. Um, this is very ambiguous. The, if the, that is the case, this may, as I said, trigger over removals. And I think it would be very important to introduce provisions that would allow platforms to make their own consideration when it comes to the determination of whether a specific piece of content is illegal or not. And also for platforms to have effective mechanisms to appeal to challenge the determinations, the allegations uh, um, presented by a third, a third party. So I think that there's some work still to be done when it comes to the drafting the language of Article 14. But probably the most important, I mean, or the most problematic uh, provisions are included, as it has already been said, in Articles 26 and 27. Articles 26 and 27 apply only to very large online platforms, that is to say platforms that have more than 45 million users. Uh, but basically these provisions include a series of duties of care for platforms. Basically they oblige platforms to make an assessment of the risks stemming from uh, the functioning and the use of the services they offer. So the risks are not only connected to the way a certain platform operates or the way a certain platform is built, but also to the way users may use the services of the platform, uh, may have access to the service of, uh, of the platform. So this is um, uh, some sort of a sophisticated assessment. And of course, then uh, in accordance to these platforms are forced or obliged to take the what, are, what can be called or what are called um, mitigation measures in order to mitigate the risks that they, they create. Hmm? What are these risks? These risks consist of the dissemination of illegal content, negative effects for fundamental rights and the intentional manipulation of the service by users. When it comes to the dissemination of illegal content, it is not clear uh, whether we are talking about content that has already been declared as illegal, content that the platform will decide and determine that is illegal, or perhaps uh, to anticipate the future dissemination of illegal content by an actor that has already been disseminating illegal content on a certain platform. Depending on how we interpret this risk, the risks or the effects, the impact on freedom of expression will be will diverge. But in any case, these this idea of putting in the hands of platforms the responsibility to assess whether there's a risk that illegal content might be disseminated is presented in a very vague manner and of course opens, I mean, creates important 
caveats, important doubts on whether this has to be interpreted and applied in practice. The same would apply with regards to the risk of uh, creating negative effects on fundamental rights. Here, the text, the wording is of the of the proposal is using this term negative effects. Is that the same as violating fundamental rights or it is something different? Are we talking about something that is illegal because the violation of any fundamental right is per se something illegal? Or we are talking about some sort of an effect that might be negative, but not necessarily illegal. If that is the case, perhaps then it would be completely wrong to force a platform to adopt actions, adopt measures against this kind of content because it can perfectly be protected content. Let's imagine that, uh, for example, a user on a platform um, disseminates content that may affect the reputation of, the po of a politician. This has negative effects on a fundamental right, but at the same time, the, the content that is disseminated is fully protected under the right to freedom of information because we are talking about information that is true and is disseminated in the public interest. Would that be a case of the uh, causing negative effects for fundamental rights? Is that, if that is the case, this can have very negative effects. And also, I mean, something that we shouldn't forget is the fact that determining the balance between two fundamental rights, for example, is something that courts do, and it would be very problematic to transfer this responsibility on platforms. Last but not least, the intentional manipulation of the service um, is related to causing, for example, negative effects on election processes and civic discourse. Um, this is extremely broad and extremely vague, and it doesn't seem reasonable to put in the hands of platforms the obligation to make these co very complex assessments regarding issues that are at the core of our societies. To what extent civic discourse is plural enough? To what extent uh, there are um, certain expressions in the public sphere that have a negative effect on civic discourse. This is something that is very much open to, to interpretation and to force platforms to make an assessment of this nature is particularly problematic and may lead to the situation where platforms impose restrictions, certain limits to the dissemination of content, thus affecting, in fact, the plurality of and, and the diversity of viewpoints in, in the public sphere. And here we need to take into account that this assessment is to be made by platforms in the first instance, but then there will be regulatory bodies at the national and, and European level that will be in a way assessing the way platforms have made their own assessment. At, at the end of the day, the European Commission might be intervening in this field. So here we are talking about a very complex decision-making process with the intervention of different bodies, not all of them being independent because the European Commission is not an independent body to determine in this process of determining the rules, the moderation rules that are acceptable within the context of a democratic society. Perhaps this is too open, too vague to be put in a provision uh, uh, of, the, of the DSA because the implications that this may have are very, very strong, as you may imagine. And here also, what is important to note is that um, uh, uh, platforms uh, are pushed to work together with, uh, with regulators and the European Commission in the drafting of codes of conduct. These codes of conduct are presented as voluntary codes of conduct, but in fact, they are not voluntary because not accepting from the side of platforms to draft or to participate in the drafting of this code of conduct can be considered as a sign of lack of proper mitigation measures when it comes to systemic risks. So once again, I think that these, the way the systemic risks um, are defined and the way the obligations for platforms are defined uh, when it comes to dealing with systemic risks and mitigating systemic risks are extremely open, extremely vague, 
um, they contain uh, distribution uh, of uh, different uh, of uh, different uh, powers of different responsibilities between different bodies and may trigger over removal of content and the state at the end of the day having public authorities regulating not only illegal content but also harmful content and this is something that i believe needs to be avoided for the sake of the right to freedom of expression with this i mean i'm going to stop here because i mean i already expressed too many things perhaps but i thought that these were very important elements for, for the debate for the debate y ahora uh, pues uh, agradeciendo su atención le paso I thank your attention and I give the floor to Loreto, who is a, a professor on communication and who is an expert on communication law. She's Loreto Corredoira. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. And, uh, welcome to our guests uh, from all over the world. Um, uh, I, I am very glad to be here, of course, I'm very grateful for being such a good company with these uh, colleagues that I am going to introduce you right now. Um, solo quiero recordar para los hispanohablantes y para for Spanish speaking participants, I want to remind you that there is an uh, interpreting uh, option, a simultaneous interpreting English. option, and so you can like listen to translation from English into Spanish, okay. uh, from Spanish into English. Thank you very much. Uh, let me introduce, first of all, uh, uh, briefly, but uh, I think it's good you to know who is going to speak right now. Uh, first of all, Dr. Marco Bassini, who holds a PhD in constitutional law and European law from the University of Verona, and who is teaching, uh, a teaching fellow in constitutional law at Bocconi University, from which he graduated in law in uh, 2010. And uh, precisely his doctoral thesis was focused on the constitutional protection of fundamental rights on the internet uh, in a comparative perspective. He is also a member of the IRLCL or International Research Group uh, Constitutions in the Age of the Internet. So this is um, very, very, very appropriate for this uh, panel. And he also has co-edited the volume Tower and Internet Bill of rights, uh, published in Rome in 2015. Uh, uh, later, we'll talk uh, Dr. Konstantinos Komaitis, who is the Senior Director of uh, Policy Strategy and Development at the Internet Society. He, as you can imagine, he provides analysis and strategic advice in support of the Internet Society's policy, advocacy, and mission, including, of course, the promotion of the open development, evolution, and use of the internet for the benefit of all people throughout the world. Uh, third uh, will be Dr. Joao Quintais, who is assistant professor of information law. So he's a colleague of my of my field at the Faculty of Law at the University of Amsterdam. He studies intellectual property law. Uh, but also the implication of copyright laws and its algorithm uh, enforcement on internet and how that uh, affects to the uh, internet user rights and freedom. So this is also that we can talk um, today. And recently, uh, I think I must say that he, recently he got the talent uh, program Benny grant for the project Responsible Algorithm, how to safeguard freedom of expression well, uh, and finally, or at, least, uh, at, at the end, uh, Adrian Batke, who is the member of the European Parliament and chair of the Committee on Legal Affairs, will send us a video uh, presentation. So um, um, I think we can start. And Marco Bassini, uh, you, can, you, can, you have the floor. You can be the first. Uh, you have like four minutes, more or less, four or five minutes maximum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes. Even if I'm Italian, I, I don't speak Spanish. My Spanish is very poor, so um, I, I regret to speak in English. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, uh, I would like to make some comments very briefly and shortly on, on the report presented by the, the, the good friend Juan Barata, that, uh, that it's a pleasure to meet again. Uh, 
I think uh, the comments uh, made in this report are actually capturing very key issues in the context of this proposal of regulation. Because I see, uh, I think we can all agree on the fact that uh, it's that time is right. Time is definitely right for change in the legal framework. Uh, but what we need to consider, and in my view, in, in my personal perspective, uh, this proposal is not considering uh, properly, in my view, is that when it comes to regulating platform, we are in a way regulating indirectly freedom of expression, as Han pointed out very, very clearly, in my view. And so we shouldn't forget the lesson we had from the United States, where basically Section 230 is a very important provision uh, granting this blanket immunity. That is probably a provision deserving some changes, probably too much broad, a very broad exemption that today should be in a way revisited to preserve a fair balance between the interests at stake. But we shouldn't forget why Section 230 was introduced in that way and with such broad formula, because the idea was to create incentives for platforms to carry out content creation and moderation in a virtuous way. So without creating any possible pressure depending on liability except for specific categories of content, content that we can say are crystal clear uh, illegal. And that way we made it possible for the internet to become what we know as the internet today. Of course, that legal framework is a bit obsolete and the same applies to the e-commerce directive. I think everyone agrees that the Digital Services Act has to be welcome as an important attempt to make rules more tailored to the specific job each platform is, is doing basically so to change. But uh, actually I feel uh, we should consider uh, very carefully the possible consequences of creating, uh, uh, let's say certain kind of obligations or not framing, not shaping this kind of obligations as Han pointed out in a very clear and accurate and precise way. And I, let me just refer to something that is not connected per se to the Digital Services Act, but it's very, it's very debated nowadays. Um, that is the implementation of Article 17 of the Copyright Directive that's mentioned before. If you look at that provision, I see there is an interesting debate, I'm, I'm, I'm in Italy, but I know that this is a point discussed also in other countries, concerning how to translate in the implementation in domestic law, the best step for close. If translating that close as maximum efforts, so requiring internet service provider, or, or online video sharing provider to uh, perform uh, let's say, the maximum efforts they can take, or requiring, in a way, a more qualitative, uh, let's say, effort. So requiring best efforts only and not maximum efforts. This is probably uh, another important sign that words matter, that uh, in this specific respect, when it comes to changing the rules, not only on liability, but we'll say on the obligations applicable to internet service provider, we can definitely create very important consequences and spillover effects with freedom of expression. So I think the report very accurately uh, points out many important points. Let me just mention, and uh, then I'm concluding my speech because I think that time is over, uh, the, the problem of the extraterritorial orders, the problem of creating basically the enforcement in, in a variety of across different states of certain uh, certain basically orders that are supposed to be relying on the specific understanding of freedom of expression. I think that we still have not a very clear idea of what the, the two courts of justice decisions in, in Facebook and uh, Google Neil mean, at least I'm talking about myself, but I think the, those judgments still have to be understood properly. And just looking at the provision that we see in the Digital Services Act mentioned by Hon, I think we can realize how much is, 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 this is a very sensitive point we should very carefully consider. And so thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to share with you my views. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vasily and Dr. Komaitis, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for your kind invitation. So I want to talk a little bit about the internet um, and I will focus on upload filters. Uh, the internet is in, 
is an inherently human technology. There is something really profoundly human about the ability of networks to make independent decisions about how to self-govern, while at the same time adhere to a set of protocols that ensure they interoperate and collaborate with one another. So this human aspect is important because anything that seeks to append it will also mean that any exercise of human rights becomes strained and challenged. So with this in mind, I would like to focus my brief intervention on, on upload filters. A bit of context first. Currently, and I need to make this clear, the DSA does not explicitly mention upload filters. However, there is some inclination from certain groups, first of all, to have them included as part of the DSA. And moreover, Article 26, and Joanne referred to it, provides that very large online platforms should assess systemic risks related to the dissemination of illegal content. Now, over the years, experience has shown that governments and the commission in particular have had a very different understanding of how to address the dissemination of illegal content. In particular, national governments tend to promote the use of upload filters in order to detect and prevent illegal content from even being uploaded in the first place. Some governments have sought to mandate the removal of manifestly illegal content within 24 hours, or in the case of terrorism content within one hour. This can only happen through upload filters. So as online platforms become key infrastructure for users, the moderation practices they adopt are not only about content removal. And this is a very important thing to note because through such techniques, online platforms undertake a governance function, which must ensure the productive, pro-social and lawful interaction of their users. So what is it at stake? One of the core properties of the internet is that it is based on an open architecture of interoperable and reusable building blocks. In addition to this open architecture, technology building blocks work together collectively to provide services to end users. At the same time, its building block delivers a specific function. And all this allows for fast and permissionless innovation everywhere. So aside from the fact that upload filters cannot solve societal problems, which is for instance, terrorism or, or you, you name it, mandating upload filters can adversely affect the internet and the way it works. Generally, the internet infrastructure can be impacted by unnecessary technology tools like deep packet inspection or DNS blocking or even upload filters. These tools produce consequences that run counter to the benefits expected by the internet. They compromise its flexibility and they do not allow the internet to continuously serve a diverse and constantly evolving community of users and applications. Instead, what they do is that they require significant changes to the network in order to support their use. The current policy objective of upload filters is twofold. First of all, regulating content, and, and secondly, taming the dominance by certain players. These are legitimate objectives, but as technology tools, upload filters fail on both counts, ironically. Not only do they have limitations in moderating content effectively, we have plenty of cases where we've heard that they overblock or underblock content, but they also cement the dominant position of big technology companies. And given the cost of creating such tools and the requirement for online platforms to have systems that ensure the fast, rigorous, and efficient takedown of content, there is a trend emerging where smaller players depend on the systems of bigger ones. In conclusion, there is a real risk that upload filters become a permanent feature of the internet's architecture and online dialogue. This is not a society that any of us should want to live in, a society where speech is determined by software that will never be able to grasp the subtlety of human communication. And with that, I conclude, and thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Komaitis, and also for the brief uh, intervention. Now, Dr. Quintais, whenever you want. Thank you very much. So good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak here, especially to Juan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I would also like to congratulate him for his excellent study, which I had the pleasure to read. Now, just a preliminary remark. My neighbor remi remember today to drill and hammer away. So if you hear that in the background, it's a sort of analog filter to my and censorship to my, to my comment. So, 
I'm going to do a brief reflect, reflection on the impact of the Digital Services Act, the DSA, on the right to freedom of expression, and especially in light of the study. So the study focuses on specific provisions, Articles 8, 14, 26, and 27. And I'll do some framing considerations first, and then speak briefly on Articles 8 and 14. I'm happy to discuss the others afterwards, but since they were mentioned already, maybe it's important to say this. So I think it's good to start to recognize from the outset that there's a particular policy and legislative climate in Europe where there's an ongoing push at institutional and legislative level towards what's called an enhancement of the responsibility of online platforms. This means in practice and for these platforms, level of additional obligations regarding proactive measures and content moderation, additional exposure to liability, and additional responsibility for balancing fundamental rights at the private level. Now, this enhanced responsibility push was preceded by years of cases of court of justice struggling with particularly, but not only, interpreting the safe harbors in the e-commerce directive vis-a-vis -vis sector specific and or national rules. Now, this is an ongoing effort, as mentioned before, and is illustrated even today by the judgment in joint cases of YouTube and Ciando. So the result is for the foreseeable future, we're going to be living with a fragmented legal framework, not just in different pieces of legislation of different orders, directive versus regulation, general versus sector specific, but also in time. Example, how does the court's interpretation of concepts and rights in pre-existing law is going to affect recent and proposed legislation. Now the DSA is the centerpiece of this push, but we must not forget, as was mentioned by Juan, that its context is broader. The tackling illegal content online communication recommendation, what was mentioned before on sector specific rules like the copyright directive, there is content regulation, AVMSD, etc. So it's all a complex web of rules and the fundamental rights implications are across the board. Now, how does the DSA deal with this? Well, it deals with it with what I call a bifurcated and tiered approach to regulation. Chapter two sets out the liability regime for intermediary service providers, basically e-commerce directives 2.0, with some noteworthy additions in the form of a Good Samaritan clause and rules on orders or injunctions. Here, the study focuses on article eight, which applies to all providers of intermediary services and the risk, especially of Article A2, on extra extraterritorial effect. I think this trend starts, as was mentioned also by my mark with Facebook Austria, opened a certain door and we've gone all in now in A2. I think the what the study recommends here is, is sensible, maybe we can discuss it, but I would even say that we have to go further and really restrict the reach of this article and extraterritorial effect to further safeguards. Now then chapter three deals with due diligence obligations that are independent of the liability framework. These are asymmetric obligations that apply to intermediary services, hosting providers, online platforms, and very online, large online platforms or VLOPs. Now they are cumulative, and they uh, apply increasingly to these types of platforms, being that VLOPs at the end have a larger number of obligations. And here the study focuses on, as Juan mentioned, notice in action in Article 14 that applies to all providers of hosting services and the systemic duties and responsibilities that only apply to VLOPs. I just want to briefly talk, touch on Article 14, and that will be my, my main point. Well, there's two problems that are identified. The vague and broadly worded concept of illegal content, which may and I think will lead to overblocking and over removal. And this point that was also mentioned of Article 14.3, according to which notice equals actual knowledge, that meaning that the platform either removes or blocks the content or it loses its liability exemption under what is now Article 5. Now, this might sound sensible at first glance, but it's the proverbial nonsense on stilts. Fortunately, today's judgment in YouTube and Silando may already indicate a way out of this in paragraphs 115 and 116. So without going into detail and closing on this, in my view, maybe this is wishful thinking reading, the court requires an extra assessment by the provider beyond the mere reception of a notice. And now this should be clarified further, of course, in Article 14 DSA, either with additional language like the study provides, or I would say preferably just let's do away with it altogether and qualify the list of elements in paragraph two as minimum requiring a sort of at least provision. And I think with that, I would close, but I'm happy to discuss the systemic duties and obligations further. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And now uh, we have the video presentation uh, by our last uh, panelist, uh, Adrián Vázquez. Uh, En primer lugar, disculparme por no poder estar con, con ustedes en vivo. First of all, I apologize uh, 
for now to be in a face to face with you and uh, secondly i want to thank you for inviting me as the president of one of the commissions uh, at the european parliament we sit in charge of this uh, matter which is the law uh, department of the European Parliament. Uh, it's important to take into account the context because of the complexity of this uh, law. The uh, drafting proposal uh, is, uh, uh, being, uh, ex is being studied by the INCO and by other parliamentary commissions so, so that we can uh, complement uh, and enrich uh, the text that will be voted uh, at the European Parliament uh, regarding the role of uh, jury, which is the uh, Commission of Law uh, Affairs, uh, will focus on compensating uh, the uh, vision of the market that will be discussed at INCO. We want to introduce the maximum warranties uh, in what regards to the uh, law uh, safety that we always try to defend. We will also try to defend transversability uh, so that the customer of the DSA in the two commissions uh, have different political colors. Uh, and we are doing a very useful work so that we have a very positive outcome. In this uh, moment, we'll do our best to, to reach uh, this uh, target. During the exchange of opinions that we had with the jury regarding the text in May, which was really positive, we started to uh, identify the most complex uh, concepts uh, in this block uh, and will uh, focus on them. There are three that I want to highlight. First, the uh, introduction of uh, a notice and stay down mechanism. It will be a mechanism that will uh, uh, oblige platforms to notify illegal or negative content, harmful content, to be deleted uh, without any need to report uh, the same content uh, once and again. Then the second is the uh, demand to towards uh, the platforms that uh, do not cooperate uh, with uh, the report with reporting the uh, uh, harmful content and then the third is the limits to harmful content uh, which is not illegal regarding the times the schedule uh, it's important the uh, and the UA Commission will be voting at the end of September and at the end of the year will vote uh, this directive uh, at the European Parliament uh, and we will find this most uh, safe, uh, the safe way uh, so that we provide the uh, strongest uh, text possible. The proposal of the European Commission is important to reinforce uh, the law uh, pillars uh, of uh, the rest of the directives uh, which uh, uh, regulate the intervention of platforms in the, in the fight against harmful content. The digital world is a, a dynamic ecosystem and it uh, advances uh, quicker than the laws are regulating it. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, uh, determined, we have uh, detected that our regulations uh, do not establish uh, the responsibilities of uh, all the platforms and users uh, and the values that must be uh, uh, protected. So the uh, European regulations uh, entail more involvement from the side of the companies uh, so that they can help uh, this society to protect the rights of, of uh, citizens uh, and the rights uh, of internet. This is a positive uh, uh, approach because it allows protecting two needs. First, the need that the platforms identify, analyze uh, and give an answer regarding the risk uh, associated to society. Second, the need to keep the obligations so that they are not burdened for economic and social development of uh, Europe through the digital economy. Platforms cannot have the final uh, uh, power to determine whether a content is illegal or not, but they uh, have to take into account that what is not legal outside the, the net, it's also illegal on the internet. Uh, and they 
need to have the, the possibility of withdrawing that uh, content uh, and we need to establish the mechanisms uh, to uh, delete that content in, in a safe way and very quickly the uh, withdrawal of that information uh, nearly automatically with the mechanisms uh, that have been proposed uh, such uh, as the notice uh, open lots of opportunities but they also entail uh, some legal challenges such as the uh, uh, error margins in the detection of illegal content or the uh, with the the implications in the rights of the citizens. And that's why we will focus during the, new, in the, the next months in trying to find new answers and involving all the stakeholders, uh, combining the warranties and the efficiency of the directive. Hello. Hi, now I can see myself. Um, I want to thank the University of Valencia, the PDLA, uh, for inviting me, uh, for inviting me to moderate this second panel in the afternoon. My esteemed colleagues from civil society organizations uh, defending freedom of expression and opinion. First of all, I'd like to, I'd like to introduce you to Maria Luisa Stasi. Uh, who is a senior legal officer at Article 19, uh, which is an international uh, London-based not-for-profit organization defending people's freedom of opinion and expression. Her intervention will be followed by that of uh, Renate Schroeder, who is the director of the European Federation of Journalists. Then we have with us uh, um, Jan Penfrat, the senior policy advisor from the European Digital Rights, and he's uh, uh, in charge of uh, platform regulation on online disinformation, surveillance and telecommunications. And last but not least, we have the pleasure to host uh, uh, Professor Lorenzo Cotino from the University of Valencia, who is also a member of the Transparency Council of the Community of Valencia, and Director of the Privacy Area at the Observatory of Social and Ethical Impact on AI. I would like to ask all of you uh, the same question. We have heard from the experts and from Joan uh, the uh, main concerns uh, on the current proposal of the DSA uh, regarding the protection of freedom of expression and information, in particular revolving around the three concerns, the extraterritoriality, the notice and take down system and the risks of uh, filtering and over removal, and also the uh, special duty of care assigned to very large platforms and ensuing risks uh, that this generates. But what I would like to ask you as representative of civil society organizations, what is what were your main advocacy points ahead of the preparation of the drafting of this proposal, which we all knew was coming? And uh, what do you think are the strengths and weaknesses of this proposal from your point of view of defenders of freedom of expression? I would like to start with Marisa, please. You have the, Maria Luisa, sorry, you have the floor. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, thanks uh, everybody for good afternoon everybody thanks for the invitation uh, I realize that everyone else is going to speak in English so I might switch to English as well um, I am uh, very delighted to be here uh, I've been exposed so far to uh, a number of very very nice and interesting ideas so it's going to be difficult in a way to try to add my two cents to this conversation uh, but uh, uh, I'll give it a try and I'll try to be short also because I'm, I, I'm extremely confident that uh, the excellent speakers after me will add their own points as well. And uh, I guess the main, the main point here is uh, to enrich the debate as much as possible and hear from others um, uh, being plenty in, in, in the conversation. Uh, the, what we expected. So we had, of course, uh, a lot of hopes on this DSA because we saw all the shortfalls over the years about the, the system uh, that was put in place by the platforms, uh, the self-regulatory system, 
uh, was not sufficient, was not providing adequate responses, was not protecting free expression um, sufficiently. We were collecting uh, stories of individuals that saw their free expression rights uh, um, violated at different layers. So expectations were high. The need for a proper instrument was high. Uh, also, the worries were high. Uh, in a way that um, we uh, were confronted, we are confronted with a situation where we have very concentrated market with a number of players, a limited number of players with a lot of power and control on the free flow of information in society and how, what and when we can access and share online. Uh, so we, we were conscious, we are conscious that it's, it is a difficult balance to find. Uh, that want to uh, address markets problem problems related to the, the way the services are provided and fundamental rights in the digital environment. So uh, being conscious of all of this, I, I, I think I can generally say that the DSA is a, is, a, is a good first step, although it has a number of shortfalls that we are strongly trying to advocate for <laughs> in order to see uh, um, this um, the negotiations of the parliament and then on the council to, to be uh, an effort to uh, if possible, um, improve the text as much as possible. I'm going to pick two specific battles to start with, and then I'm going to be happy to uh, take questions or discuss afterwards. But as I said, I want to leave space to the other uh, people as well. I'm sure they're going to raise excellent points. So um, one, one of the points is uh, um, this uh, notice and action system. Um, we are, um, I, I endorse a number of, of thoughts that have been shared before me about uh, how complex uh, this system is, but in line with what I said, so where we start from, from this high concentration in markets and high concentration of power, what we suggest, uh, what we see in the notice and action system is that even if it would be the perfect system possible uh, in terms of due process, it will still attribute to the to the platforms the final decision about what is illegal, at least in a preliminary phase, what is illegal and what is not, and what needs to be taken down and what not. Uh, unless we think that every time we need to go to, to court, which would be ideal from a fundamental rights perspective, but possibly not really manageable in, in terms of scale. So what we suggest is that the first step, rather than being the company designing, uh, we we suggest a sort of a, to think about a sort of a notice and notice system, where the platform needs to is going to receive the complaint, but then is going to not only uh, um, uh, inform the uploader, but also let the uploader make his own assessment as well. And then, of course, there will be the possibility of appeal about this decision, but it's more like the platform remaining what it's, it pretends to be, an intermediary in between those two parties fighting about the legality or illegality of, of a specific piece of content. Uh, of course, the details will be dramatically important, uh, but this is, this is the idea that I would like to share with you. Um, we also have a lot of concerns about due diligence, but it, uh, I, I have the feeling that the the, um, the argument has been explored and unpacked already quite a lot. So I'll, I'll rather focus on Article 29 and the recommended system. Uh, I think it's pretty uh, evident that the, the more we go and we discuss these topics and quantum moderation issues in depth, the more, the more we realize that the, the big problem we have is not only with removal of content, but it's also about you know how this, this recommended system system they demote or promote or uh, personalize the content that we see and when I when I say we I mean each of us because of course each of us is exposed to something uh, different uh, possibly widely different um, so um, we think that article 29 uh, raised the attention on, on those systems but it sort of fall a little bit short first of all it it it, it provides for basic transparency uh, about the criteria that, um, that instructs, let's say, this recommended system. And it also uh, provides basic guarantees that the user is gonna be able to somehow, somehow interact with the, with the different possibilities and select some, some criteria if they're provided, if this possibility is provided by the platforms, plus uh, there should be a possibility that is not based on profiling. Now, those are, certainly good provisions, but we don't really see why those provisions that are so basic for the challenges we are talking about should be limited uh, only to a very large online platform. Um, if, if we take out the micro uh, platforms or the micro uh, uh, companies, 
then we think that this should be very much the bottom line in the market. And then for very large online platform, what we suggest is to build on top of this and to be, uh, um, to, to be forced to provide at least an option that is not based on, on, on profiling. Plus, uh, the specific proposal we have is that we would like to see the market for the comment system to be opened up to new players. So what we would like to, to, to do is to empower the user in a way and to put the user in a situation that can still be on Facebook or on Twitter, but then decide that the recommended system they want to use on those platforms is not the one provided by Facebook or Twitter, but possibly by an alternative player. And, and this, in our, in, in our um, vision, uh, if we open up the market and we create competition, we might have an alter a, a variety of recommended system that follow different business models. And then some of them, they might protect our privacy better. Some of them, they might be more sensitive to diversity. And then we, users, each, each user is going to be empowered to, to uh, select and pick the one they prefer. Now, to realize this, we need to take care of the contractor layer. So the contractual relationship between the platform and the, the uh, third party layer but also the technical layer. And this is one of the reasons why we're strongly convinced that we need to push for more interoperability in the DSA and also in the DMA, but as a, a, a tool, an essential tool to empower user and open up those markets where we do have a lot of problematics um, aspects. I'll stop here uh, for the Thank sake you. of brevity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being so concise and offer even the proactive the solutions uh, that have not been considered before, but are definitely food for thought. And now, I would give the floor without further ado to Renate Schrader for her consideration. Thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you, everybody, for this very interesting discussion today, indeed. Um, I'm also trying not to repeat myself, um, but maybe I will be a bit more larger than dealing only with freedom of expression, as I'm representing journalists here. And there is a lot of stake when it comes to media pluralism and the future of journalism. And as you ask for our advocacy points, I will mention them as well. And then in the second part, say a few more things specifically regarding freedom of expression and how to guarantee editorial content. So what has been important for us, of course, is how to rebalance the power of large platforms, how to make them accountable, transparent, how to deal with disinformation, and of course, how to best limit third party influence of editorial decisions by content providers. Removal of journalistic content, and it has been said already, and I also like to refer to Juan Barate, who really gave an excellent uh, explanation, the distinction between harmful and legal content, indeed the need for formal definitions, maybe also to decide it at national level, as there is also cultural perspectives involved, must be carefully weighed and not subjected to automatic filtering indeed. The new law must be an enabler and not a roadblock for media freedom. The power of the big platforms and gatekeepers has contributed to the market failure we face in journalism as both advertisement and copyright revenues go mainly to the internet platforms. And without ensuring a level playing field and fair digital competition enforcement, the future of professional journalism is at risk. And of course, here we also deal with the digital market. What we have asked for before um, the DSA process started and also during the public consultation has been high transparency standards on all online platforms regarding algorithmic decision-making processes and content recommendations. You all know that today, actually the news agenda is dominated by that. The accountability of online platforms to public authorities through new transparency and due diligence obligations has been said already, but it's important to repeat. Of course, a strengthened code of conduct to deal with this and misinformation harming our ecosystem and our democracy, and we need that to be strengthened. I also would like to um, mention the fair and inclusive working conditions for all solo self-employed media workers and the right for unions to present them and negotiate uh, collective agreements behalf of them that has been a part in the public consultation of the commission and it is being taken up for. 
So all these issues, we welcome progress and therefore we, we welcome the, the DSA um, at the moment. But we regret that the DSA does not sufficiently set limits on big tech business models based on the massive collection of personal data, profiling and data advertisement. We also regret that the DSA does not address the excessive power of big tech over information flows. In addition to content moderation rules, we need rules to open the markets to new platforms, to multiply the channels of public discourse and journalistic content. We believe the DSA must be stronger, not weaker, and we firmly appeal specifically to the European Parliament to be firm on the following points when it comes to protecting online editorial content from interference by online platforms. And I have two points here I would just like to strengthen again. You all know that today's journalistic content regularly gets removed and journalist accounts blocked by online platforms without any prior warning. Platform operators should not be allowed to exercise any control over journalistic content available on the platforms. The DSA should ensure that journalists and the media they work for remain solely responsible for the content they produce. We call on the European institutions to exclude all editorial platforms from the scope of the obligations set out in chapter three, as they would indeed endanger editorial freedom. What we are missing, for example, in Mrs. Scheide Moses' draft report, she is a rapporteur of the main um, committee dealing with it, which is internal market and consumer protection, is a safeguard that would prohibit online platforms from removing, disabling access to, or otherwise interfere with editorial content. We have been successful with the culture committee, but much more work is to be done. And last but not least, online platforms shall not use tools to assess, control, or label journalistic content. The DSA should preserve and protect the self-regulation and editorial control of the press via media councils. We, together with the publishers, oppose, for example, the issue of so-called trustworthy indicators. The distribution must be based on non-discriminatory principles. Proper brand attribution of editorial content is important. Transparency is crucial when it comes to who is responsible for the editorial content. Um, that, in a nutshell, are, are our main issues when it comes to the issues discussed here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renate. And it's great that you mentioned the additional requirement of uh, transparency standards because it allows me to squeeze in very quickly the position that we as uh, ECNL, the European Centre for Not-for-Profit Law, made uh, to the DSA together with other organisations, uh, uh, including uh, EDRI, um, um, Access Now, Algorithm Watch, with regard to the part Article 31 of the DSA on data access and scrutiny, because we believe that in order to protect freedom of expression, there is also a need to make this platform more accountable on their processes. But there is uh, an objective lack of access to data. So we originally asked the Commission to introduce obligations to provide this access. We are glad that the Commission did it, but we are still not happy because so far this access is only granted to vetted researchers affiliated with academics. And we would like the Commission to acknowledge the existence to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis of a public interest, which would allow not only academics, but also, for instance, journalists to access data in order to understand how these platforms influence the formation of opinion. But Thanks for adding that, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, um, um, Jan ma maybe will add this, but uh, uh, because he, he Edri was also part of this uh, coalition that led to this, but in any case, uh, I am happy to give him the floor to hear from him the advocacy points that Edri uh, made and uh, their take on the current proposal, proposal and room for improvement. Over to you, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, I find it really interesting to see that all the academics who spoke on the first panel, thank you for that, very interesting, and all the advocates um, speaking now on the second panel seem to agree and be equally worried about the over-removal of content. So whoever you ask who knows what they're talking about seem to be not trusting the big tech companies 
to take the right decisions when it comes to content removal. Um, and, and so I think this is, a, a re it's regrettable that um, uh, that parliamentarian uh, Vasquez Lazara isn't here um, among us to, to hear this, because I think um, the, the, the mistake that a number of lawmakers are making when they're thinking about this at the moment is that they, that they see the BSA as a kind of <clears throat> as a kind of piece of criminal law um, where the main aim is to remove I don't know about you, but you seem to be frozen. Uh, I ask the technicians to see. If uh, we have a problem, we, you know, in the next minute or so, we may give the board the true uh, rent. So, uh, no, there he is. No. My apologies. Ah, never mind. Sorry that you Sorry were frozen that. for a few seconds. I had a great connection for the whole session, and now that I speak, it breaks down. So I was saying that. Um, so it's a pity that um, that uh, parliamentarian was. Lazara isn't here to hear this because a lot of lawmakers are treating the DSA as if it was a piece of, of criminal law. Um, and, and this is also one of the, you know, where the, where the major goal is to remove as much illegal content as possible or allegedly illegal content as possible. Um, and I think this is also one of the major messages that, that Adri is making in our advocacy here in Brussels um, is that, um, that the DSA is not a piece of criminal law, but it's a single market legislation which has as major aim to protect consumers and to rebalance um, the, the market powers um, that exist in the, in the online platform market. Um, and this is something I think that, that would need to, to be put forward more, um, uh, more strongly when we talk to, um, to lawmakers. And the, the major kind of shift in the debate that we would like to see is that we, that we stop limiting the debate to the question of how and who should treat every single piece of potentially illegal content under which time frame? Um, and that we, that we focus on the broader question, why is it that illegal content and, you know, for that matter, uh, legal but potentially maybe harmful content has become such a huge problem uh, on the major platforms? And I think this is very much linked to the business models that platform have established, platforms have established, which is showing us advertising based on the knowledge that they have about every single person. Um, and this obviously means they, they need us to stick to our screens as much as possible. They need to lock us in into their platforms um, for as long as possible uh, to, to reap all that, that personal data and then show us advertising um, for as long as possible, you know, as many hours as possible of the day. And, and this is a major problem because it creates commercial incentives for platforms to promote um, divisive, exactly the kind of problematic content that we now kind of seek to uh, seek to remove um, and and so what we would want to see and just I want to close with with a couple of the ideas that that, that we are discussing here with with policymakers what we would want to see is that we have strict regulation on which kind of personal data um, platforms are allowed to use for the purpose of showing targeted advertising and by the way also for recommender systems I think this is a topic that is slightly distinct yet related um, because it's the same kind of, you know, systems that, that work behind behind the curtain. Um, give people more power over what kind of content they see. And um, and Marilisa has, has mentioned the example already, which I think is a great way of dealing with this, is giving people control over the recommender systems that they actually want to use. At the moment, everybody, did, Facebook tells us, just as an example, Facebook tells us, um, sorry, we do what we can. To, to manage, to, to moderate content. And that's all there is, right? Trust us, we do whatever is possible. Um, and we have no way of knowing whether that is true. We just have to trust Facebook that that is the best that there is in terms of content moderation or recommender systems. Um, if there was actual competition in recommender systems um, and in content moderation, um, we would know better. And we could see if the market, uh, if competitors could produce better systems than that. At the moment, that's impossible because the market is locked up. So using interoperability in this area um, to open up the market is a great tool to find out. Um, and and if, if we haven't done this as a kind of minimum step, how can we then, based on Facebook's assurances, um, believe 
um, that the kind of content removal policies, especially the very tight deadlines that the rapporteur in the, in the Consumer Protection Committee has proposed, uh, namely 24 hours and seven days, how can we think that this is a good idea to implement if the basis of our knowledge is so limited? Um, I'll stop it for here because there are a lot of other issues Thank that you. we work on, obviously, but I think we can yes. keep this in the discussion as well. Thank you so much for this additional food for thought, and I will immediately pass on the word to Lorenzo. Hello, good afternoon. It's a pleasure. To, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with you. Uh, I will make my, I will speak in Spanish uh, as a, as an exception. Well, uh, the first idea the first idea is uh, my position. I don't represent the the civil society, but I like the music of this DSA, but we have to wait and concrete the letter, the, the full piece. Eh, bueno, eh, como decía, hablaría en español y unas ideas muy breves. As I will say, I will present very short ideas uh, and from the doubts that have uh, been uh, underlined, uh, I will uh, uh, underlined article 7 obligation of non surprising but articles 26 and 27 big platforms with a, a systemic systemic risk obligations obligation of detecting illegal content and adopting reasonable measures uh, it uh, against the non obligation of surprising another idea is article number 6 uh, platforms uh, they can control this is reasonable, but I think that at least for bigger platforms, uh, we should establish uh, certain limits to the power to control uh, some elements, uh, some minimal uh, facts, uh, not only uh, through the protection of uh, data, which is another possibility, the idea of controlling users, by, but also limits uh, because of, uh, concerning the freedom of expression through the platforms and this is even more important uh, than it seems because article number nine allows the states member states to oblige the platforms to provide information on their users so if there are no limits to control uh, the member states will have access to uh, an information with no control Another additional idea that was already mentioned, but I think it's important to insist. Article number eight, uh, we should uh, specify which is the obligation that the platforms have of uh, uh, giving an answer to the orders issued by the states. And Last, I come from a country in which independent authorities are not independent and they are directly chosen by the political parties. Norms speak, the regulations speak of the complete independence of these entities, the digital services coordinators and the European board. I think it's important to start establishing not only when we have uh, the courts uh, involved, but also when there are independent uh, bodies uh, and they touch to freedom of speech, and they need to provide more warranties, more even than the uh, authorities concerning the protection of data, which are uh, highly uh, regulated. We'll uh, pass on the floor to uh, Irene Roche Laguna from the European Commission. I'm very keen to hear her uh, fresh impressions since she has heard about criticism, but also a lot of uh, interesting, I believe, constructive proposals for changes. So the floor is over to you to hear your reaction. Thank you. And thank you to all my panelists. You were great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesca, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hola, Lorenzo. Lorenzo and I used to study together when we were young, so it's nice to see you again. Uh, I'm very sorry because I uh, arrived a bit late, but uh, I have been following uh, via a, a colleague all the comments and all the suggestions that have been 
uh, made today. And I would like to, to make some general remarks on the DSA, or at least what is the intention of the Commission as, uh, when we elaborated the proposal. But obviously, uh, this might be different from the final result when the Council and Parliament agree on, on, this, uh, uh, on this piece of law. So we are talking about the freedom of expression in particular in the context of the DSA. And uh, we have heard in particular about Article 8 on the extraterritoriality of the orders and Article 14 on the notice and action, the possibility to have notice and stay down on the specific rules that apply to very large online platforms uh, on the uh, risk assessment and risk mitigation and how all these uh, uh, provisions together uh, can help users make a, 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 an effective exercise of their rights and the fundamental rights when online. So this is very clearly written in the article one of the DSA. This is one of the two objectives of the DSA. First is an internal market uh, instrument. We want to harmonize the rules that apply all across Europe. But second, we want to allow the effective protection of fundamental rights online. And we are not starting from scratch. It's not that one day the commission woke up and say, let's write the DSA. We are working on the, on the basis of a very rich case law by the Court of Justice on the e-commerce directive, on the Charter of Fundamental Rights, on the, from the European Court of Human Rights, on the uh, recommendation by the Council of Europe on online intermediaries that we have also followed very closely, our own recommendation on illegal content. So this has built already a, a very good understanding of the challenges that uh, illegality of content uh, builds uh, as regards uh, fundamental rights, but also in particular when channeled via online intermediaries. So the, there is a tension, and I think there will always be a tension between the need to effectively enforce the rules, the rules uh, against uh, hate speech, the rules against terrorist content, against child sexual abuse material, against the consumer uh, uh, scams, et cetera. So there are rules on illegal content everywhere, but there is a tension also with the uh, provisions that exempt intermediaries from liability. And why? Because these are the means that are used by the users to share the content. So to exercise the freedom of expression, also the freedom of information in the, at the receiving end, but also their right to privacy. If uh, intermediaries were not exempted from liability for anything that we share, they would have to, to survey and to, to, to follow and monitor everything we publish, and we would be having problems uh, from the perspective of the right to privacy. But obviously the DSA covers uh, all of the media. It's not only platforms. It's not only about big platforms against the small platforms. It's also uh, about platforms against uh, other types of hosting services or against uh, internet service providers, other kind of near conduits, et cetera. So it covers many types of uh, uh, business models and uh, we need to build rules that apply uh, proportional, in a proportionate manner, depending on the, um, the size, on the impact and the reach that uh, these uh, services might have. So as regards uh, illegal content and uh, freedom of expression, the DSA is built on the basis of uh, two different types of enforcement. I have talked about the public enforcement of public rules uh, that is uh, uh, taken by public authorities. And there we have talked about Article 8. Lorenzo has also mentioned Article 9. There has been a long discussion about these two articles. And I think uh, when reading it, people uh, expect the commission to mean more than we, what we actually say. Uh, these articles are not enabling anyone to send removal orders or to ask for information. This, uh, uh, this empowerment has to come from national rules. What we are saying in the DSA is that whenever a national law or a, a European uh, rule allows for sending such orders, 
these orders do not uh, um, affect the freedom to provide business on a cross-border basis and how to comply with different elements, but it's not an enabling provision. But the second type of uh, uh, enforcement that we are constantly talking about is private enforcement. So all these service providers, uh, or, or almost all service providers have uh, their own internal rules, the terms of service, terms of use, community standards, whatever they call them, and they, enforce them also in, in, in a given manner. What we want to avoid under the DSA is mixing and, and, and confusing these uh, two uh, roles. Public enforcement has to be of public rules and private enforcement has to deal with private rules. So we should not have private enforcement of public rules nor public enforcement of private rules. So for instance, we have article 14 on the notice and action uh, procedures which uh, uh, applies only to illegal content. It's not about the infringements on the terms and conditions or terms of service of, of the given hosting service provider. So um, under the, the DSA, we uh, also cover the procedures and the necessary due diligence that applies as regards content which might not be illegal, but is also taken down. It's also removed, it's also demoted, delisted, and uh, the user needs to have a possibility to challenge that decision or to, um, to contest whatever decision uh, a given platform has taken as, re as regards that content. If the content is uh, not taken down because it's illegal, but has been taken down because it goes against the terms of service, then uh, at least the user could have the possibility to, to challenge that decision on the basis of that contract. So um, the basis for, for, for this, and uh, I have to remind article 12 of the DSA, where uh, we, in a way, we are establishing the limits to the, to, the, to the possibility by platforms or by any service provider to control any content or to moderate content as they wish. Under this article, we um, request online intermediaries, so not only platforms, to be transparent as regards uh, the measures that they intend to put in place to moderate the content, so about the terms and conditions. And uh, not only that, they need to be diligent, objective, and proportionate when implementing such rules. So they have to take due consideration, due regard, uh, to the rights and interests uh, of all parties, and that includes also fundamental rights. So there is a need uh, when the DSA is adopted to apply these private rules in a consistent manner and in a transparent manner, in a non-discriminatory manner. So let's not forget, for instance, the case of uh, Donald Trump's accounts being taken down a, a couple of days after uh, the Americans uh, selected a different uh, president. So there was a change of, uh, of decision, and the question would be whether uh, this would be uh, objective and diligent and, and not just uh, arbitrary, an arbitrary decision without any possible, uh, possible oversight. So this is, uh, in general, what I wanted to say on the DSA as regards uh, freedom of expression, that it's across the whole instrument. So um, it, we have also heard about uh, Article 14, and in this, this is today is a special day because the court has finally uh, decided on a, on a long uh, due case on the YouTube um, case, which finally the court also gives us more um, elements to determine what should be the minimum content of a notice, what is actual knowledge. And this interpretation provided by the court, we hope from the commission that will be taken into consideration by the co-legislators when uh, working on the, the text of Article 14. So I think this is uh, of interest in the discussion today. Just a, a few remarks to, to finalize on uh, Articles 26 and 27, as regards very large online platforms. So the, the DSA 
is constructed as a sort of uh, Russian dolls that uh, cover uh, different um, categories of services depending on their impact. So we talk about all intermediary services, establishing some, some, some minimum rules about them, then hosting service providers where all the attention has uh, been focused during the last years uh, from the perspective of uh, the case law, and then online platforms, all the online platforms that we all know uh, and, and use and love and hate, and in particular, those that because they reach a, a given number of users so that represents around 10% of the population of the European Union have a, a tremendous impact. So whatever they do, just because it's uh, potentially uh, accessible by uh, one tenth of the population, they have a, a, an important potential impact and risk in the European society. So for those uh, very large online platforms, we, uh, of, we pre uh, pre propose a series of uh, rules and obligations and higher levels of, uh, of diligence, which do not uh, get to that level of a general monitoring obligation. So we do not think that there is a tension between Article 7 and uh, Article 26 and 27, in the recitals, we already make clear that nothing should be constructed in a way that builds a general monitoring obligation. But the truth is that I, I don't know any very large online platform that does not have already some uh, filtering uh, mechanisms in place. So the question is, uh, is not anymore to impose or not to impose the filters. The question is how to manage those filters in a way that is respectful with the user's fundamental rights. And I think this is where uh, the, the, the policy and the legal uh, attention has to, has to focus today. So if there is a, a given very large online platform, and obviously these rules need to be targeted to the specific business model, if they pose a specific risk, then uh, they need to, uh, to provide the necessary measures to mitigate those uh, those risks and uh, obviously for that they will also have to avoid a secondary risk provided or, or created by those mitigating measures so if they impose a, a, a filtering mechanisms a surveillance mechanism to avoid dissemination of illegal content this could score very uh, in a very low manner in the second risk which is protection of uh, fundamental rights so the, the whole system is built with uh, fundamental rights in mind, and in particular, freedom of expression and information on the internet. So I, I think I can stop here, but in any case, I want to thank all participants for the very interesting uh, ideas, interpretations, proposals that we are uh, collecting and are feeding also the, the, the discussions with the colleagues later. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Irene Roche Laguna, en nombre de los... Thanks a lot, Irene, on behalf of the Prodigiosa Volcana and the University of Valencia and the representative of the PDLA for the explanation. We know that, uh, that this uh, law, this uh, act is being drafted and we want to uh, cooperate with proposals that can be added to the uh, final text. Uh, I want to welcome everybody who uh, attended uh, this uh, uh, event. Uh, I want to thank all the moderators and all the participators. Uh, this uh, uh, event will be published and will be available. The report uh, by John Barata, which was uh, the framework of this this uh, event uh, will be uh, shared with all of you. On behalf of all the organizers, thanks uh, to everybody and we have time uh, ahead uh, to improve uh, the proposal.